What's going on, everyone? Kyle here, along with Ed, the You Know I Got So and So in Stereo podcast is back. Ed, what's going on? What's up, player? We had to take a week off, and we should never leave y'all hanging for a week because there is so much to talk about in the past two weeks of R&B. Everything dropped. Yep, and Tom didn't do his homework, so we left him off this podcast. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Tom is somewhere listening to Music Soul Child and Glenn Lewis uh, in a stack of their singles just laying on his prone body. (laughs) But really, uh, Tom will be back with us next week. I think he got a surprise visit from his parents. Couldn't get out of that. You got to love a good family, man, right, Ed? Listen, player, I I know the love and I know the struggle. So shout out to my man for holding down and being a good husband today because... Family, we love them, and Lord, sometimes you just got to love them. So, shout out to my people. I'll be honest with you. Before we get into some R&B things, Ed, I don't even know if I want to be in a relationship right now. Because let me tell you, the the other day, I went inside Janet Jackson's tour bus. That's right, the (laughs) Janet Jackson. Wait a minute. When you said you went inside her tour bus, you mean an actual bus, or is this a euphemism for something? What did you do last weekend, player? Okay, so Janet Jackson had a concert in Vancouver, and I had met up with her tour DJ. It's the guy that plays all the music to hype you guys up for Janet's performance. Um, I was doing an interview with him, DJ Active, because he put out that new song with Marsha, 90s Love. Yes. You love that song, right, Ed? Yes. Yes. I so do. I went to talk to him about it, and... He was like, you know, we can do the interview at, you know, in the tour bus. And I'm like, for real? The tour bus? Like, the Janet Jackson tour bus. So (laughs) I walked with him to the parking lot, and there were like nine tour buses all lined up one next to each other. And I went inside one of them. Can't confirm whether it was actually Janet Jackson's tour bus, but it was one of them. So I'm just going to tell everyone that I was inside Janet Jackson's tour bus. I mean, it's pretty close enough that you got to get on a tour bus, so... I mean, props to my man because he almost lived the dream fully. So I can't, I can't even find anything to hate on, and you know, hating is my second occupation. Dude, I'm telling you, once this podcast blows up, we're getting our own tour bus. I walked in there, and let me just lay it out for you. There were two flat screen TVs just attached to the wall. There was a bar full of liquor, and then on the back end of the bus, there were bunk beds. It's like, what else could you want? I think there was like a PS4 in there too. What? Play a listen. All we need, first of all, Tom is going to be over there at the mini bar. So we'll just chain him over there because that's where he's going to be. I'm going to be over there with the two TVs. I'm going to have my PS4 rock and I'm going to have my Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite on one screen and my Batman on the other screen. I'm going to be tearing it up. You'll be somewhere convincing the DJ to play some terrible Ashanti album. But it will be all yes. good. We need to take this po- podcast on the road. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, before we get into some new music, let's just get all the hate out of the way. Ed, I interviewed Pleasure P, our number two nemesis on the podcast, number one being Keisha <laughs> Cole. And can How I just did say that go? You know what? Pleasure P is actually a pretty decent guy. I was wrong See, about Pleasure P. I like him. There you go. First of all, give the listeners the background on the beef between you know I got soul and Pleasure P because to me it's hilarious. Usually I'm the beef dude, so I love to see the hate spread and grow to other people. Well, I mean, I think I've we've mentioned it on a couple of podcasts, but I wrote an article probably now about two years ago talking about the state of male R&B, especially from the last generation, you know, my generation, the Mario's, Chris Brown's, Trey Song's, Pleasure P's, right. Jay Holiday's, and if you really think about it right now, they've all, I guess except for Chris Brown, have disappeared from the radio. Even Trey has seemingly disappeared, and we yeah. were trying to figure out why that is because Keith Sweat, your boy, is still doing his thing, probably not Always. on the scale... Maybe not on the scale of what it once was, but he's still doing his thing out there. He's still touring, still releasing albums. And my favorite artist, Mario. Man, let me just say, Ed, Mario's album is called Cosmo 17, and 2017 is about to be over, so he might have, <laughs> might as well call it Cosmo 18. This is a problem. <laughs> this is very so, true. When it's This is why you can't date your albums, artist, because you're going to date yourself out of the game. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but 
I put this article together, tagged all those artists in the article, and Pleasure P was the one that I guess read it, and he was just like, this article was stupid, all this is false, and... I tried to bite my tongue and say, well, okay, but really what I wanted to say was, well, where's the album? So yes. we actually, it, it, it seemed entirely fair, but I finally got a chance to talk to him and, you know, he was real about everything, about what we all believed. You know, there's no middle ground for the generation that he's part of and that it has been a challenge, but at least he's realistic about it. And yeah, he seemed like a good dude. So no hate towards Pleasure P. And it's never any hate. And I will always emphasize that when we talk about our favorite artists here, we're just talking about them in ways that we're critical. It's because we want them to do better. It's not because, oh, we hate. Oh, how much money did you make last week? Oh, oh, oh." like, no, we want these artists to thrive. And the reason why this podcast exists is because we want to keep R&B where it is and raise it to the heights it was in its glory days. And if that means keeping our favorite artists accountable, that's what this is about. But I'll fuss about Tank later on in the show, so proceed. Uh, A little concerning, though, Pleasure P is kind of banking on Love & Hip Hop Miami to relaunch his career. And, well, I mean, it's worked for some. Your girl Cardi B is blowing up like No Tomorrow, but it's not not for everyone. Oh, my God. Don't raise my blood pressure on that. We'll get to her later on, too. Oh, Oh, man. Cardi (laughs) B. I was reading on our Facebook, Miss Superwife was like, who is this Cardi B? And is she finally (laughs) listening to the song? (laughs) I saw that. (laughs) That was funny. Oh, shout out to my girl Cece, Miss Superwife, because she is a sweetheart. And we try to protect her from the horrors of modern R&B and hip hop. And oh my goodness. Cardi B, I know there are a bunch of Cardi B fans out there. And I don't want to jump the gun about my rant that will be coming later on in the podcast. But... I wish that we would get back to liking songs because they were good and not because we just like the person that put out the song. But ugh, more on that later on. More on that later. Now, so many albums to talk about that came out in the last two weeks. And I'm trying to figure out how we're going to you know, talk about this. But I want to start off by talking about Tamar Braxton because it is her last album, The Blue Bird of Happiness. Ed, I know you're not very fond of the Tamartians and vice versa. What did you think of the album? Because I have my thoughts, but I want to hear yours. Well, I'll get into it, and it kind of gets into what I was saying a little bit about Cardi B, but a little bit about that in a second. Um, I remember when we talked about Tamar's album on, might have been the podcast before the most recent one, and some Tamartians were like, how dare this guy say that her albums are just okay? Because my... My criticism of Tamar has always been that she is a very solid artist, but who has yet to give us a great project. And that's not hating, that's just the facts of it. And this person was saying, how dare you, have you ever heard her album? And when I listened to this new album, guess what? It's a regular old Tamar album. And what do I mean by that? You've got two or three very good songs. I love my man. I love her reimagining of the makings of you i thought that was that i love that song that might be one of my favorites of the year thought it was banging but then you got the three or four goofy tamar songs that are kind of empty-headed but hey they're fun and goofy and then you got the ballads that are just kind of oversung and just a little bit over the top kind of like sings too much like she has great vocals but you got to know when to unleash them And she just like oversings it and the songs get kind of old. So again, you get a project that's like the rest of her projects. Just okay. But we have unfortunately in 2017 created this stan culture where if you're a fan of the artist, you have to accept everything they do as the unmitigated gospel. And that's how we have gotten to Cardi B. Because Cardi B, for those who unfortunately have heard the song is the number one song on radio. It is breaking new ground for female hip-hop artists. Yay, yay, clap for that. But it just ain't good. And whenever, if you visit Soul and Stereo's Facebook page, Soul and Stereo's Facebook group, the Soul and Stereo Cypher, where we talk about a lot of this stuff, if I say, I don't really like that Cardi B song, no, without question, fans will always say this. The song isn't that great, but... 
I want her to win. Therefore, you're admitting that the song is even good, <laughs> but you just want it to blow up because you're a fan of hers. And I understand supporting the artist that you like. But it's weird that we've gotten in a culture where we're like, this song isn't even good and we recognize it's stupid. But we really like this person, so we're going to push it forward. And I feel like that was a lot with the Tamarshans. Even though I would, Tamar is a thousand trillion times better artist than Cardi B. I hate that we have to not look at music critically. And we're just like, well, I'm a fan, so it's hot. No, it's okay. And you can still be a fan. I, if Keith Sweat told me to kick y'all in the balls, I would probably do it because it's Keith. But Keith's got some albums that aren't that great. And I can say that because I'm a fan. So y'all can like who you like, but please don't fool yourself. Don't run up in my mission talking about something that's hot when you know good and as well is mediocre. Wow. First off, I got to applaud you for your honesty because, yeah, a lot of Keith Sweat albums aren't good. Like most of them, I didn't say a lot. I I did not say a lot of them. Calm yourself. (laughs) And secondly, a point that you made, point that you made. So let me get this straight, Ed. You're not a fan of somebody saying, "Well, the song isn't that good, but I really want that person to win." Correct? Yes. How about? Well, the song isn't really that good, but the beats fire. Is that okay? Uh, even that I can give a little bit of props to because at least there's something in the song that makes it, you know, tangible. And that's kind of Tank's album. We'll get to him a little bit later on. I'm okay with you saying the beat's good and the lyrics are in because a lot of songs in the 90s fall in that category. But let's not pretend that somebody is an elite rapper or a fantastic vocalist or whatever and most of that the whole construction of the song, the reason why you listen to the song, is falling apart. Yep. So, as I was listening to this Tamar Braxton album, I've followed Tamar, um, especially since she's blown up, so I've listened to her albums. And this one, like you're, like you said, it sort of falls under that same realm where you know she has a couple of ballads, a couple of fun records, sample-heavy records. The biggest problem I have with this album, and... It's going to be hard for me to explain it. I want to first off say it's not a bad album. There are a lot of songs on here that I I do enjoy a lot of songs on here. Um, The opening song is even good, My Forever. And then there's the piano ballad, Heart of My Hands. That's a great song. Um, the, The album does sort of mix in together a little too much. Like it starts sounding the same. Especially but that second half, yes. Oh, when they have like three ballads back to back to back and they're all Oh my ballads. gosh. That yes. was rough. But that's not even the biggest problem I have with the album. So the album is not bad, but I just felt like it was very it, it sounded cheap. I don't I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but like just the mixing of the songs, it seemed like it was it wasn't really uh, crafted together. Very, like they, it didn't take. They didn't take a lot of time to put it together. She sit, sang oh, it I once. I get exactly what you're saying. The stands it's don't eat you of, up, but I get exactly what you're saying. It's sort of like um, that album that uh, what's that? What's that group that Keith Sweat signed? Silk. It was. It was sounded, Silk. sounded sort of like that. It sounded really cheap. Like they just recorded it out of like a garage. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, first of all, shout out to my they, boys. They probably. Silk probably did record it out of a garage, but this one sounded like that. Oh my gosh. Shout out to my boys, because I love me some Silk. But oh, that last Silk album, the uh, the mixing of it was suspect. And this wasn't as bad as the Silk album, because that is one of the worst I have heard in a long time. But I do get what you're saying, because you can, to an untrained ear, you probably wouldn't hear it. But once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And it's a lot yeah. of stuff that just... Seems like if this was my grandma, she'd be like, that cake should have stayed in the oven a little bit longer. If You know what I'm saying? Like it just, it wasn't just put together as well as it should have. And it kind of takes away from the listening experience. But if you don't know to listen for it, you probably wouldn't even catch it. It definitely took away from um, that song that she sampled from Robin Thicke, Wanna Love You Boy. Like the drums on that, they just sound messy. And it was, it was unfortunate yes. that, that song, that sound, that song had potential. It definitely did. And yeah, that was one of the songs that I definitely thought of. It's this weird, I don't know if it's, 
I know the word to say. It's not really feedback, but it's like this weird yeah. tinniness that if your ear catches it, it can't unhear it, and it takes away from the song. Yep. So, Ed, good news. Being that that's Tamar's last album, you never have to hear from the Tamartians ever again. Oh, player, listen. When's the next time we got a new season of the Braxton's or the Tamar show? I'm sure that the next season will be, I'm going to record my comeback. And Tony's oh, dropping a new album soon. She ain't going to get out shy. Play a stop. We have a new yeah. album by 2019. <laughs> we'll be on the lookout for that one. Although I read that uh, her husband, Vince Herbert, got sued for like $4 million by Sony. So, yeah. Well, now Something we're definitely like going to have a new album. Yeah. We'll see uh, how that pans out. But another major release that came out. I feel like he's on that TLC Usher level at this point, but that's Tank. <laughs> Savage. Oh, boy. Now, Ed, did you like Sex, Love, and Pain too? I did not like Sex, Love, and Pain too. So it's safe to say that you did not like this album either. <sighs> Let me take a deep breath and a swig of water because I'm gonna need it for this one as well. Um, I, and again, I love I love fans of artists because if it was not for the fans of these artists, we would have lost them to the ages long time ago. So I love that y'all love Tank as much as you do. All I ask is that you ask more of the artists that you love. It's okay to love somebody and ask them to do better. I tell Kyle to do better all the time. He doesn't listen, but I still do it out of love. (laughs) So in the case of Tank, oh my gosh, a lot of Tank stands have already come to me, fans, stands, or whatever else. Shout out to my girl, um, Tara, because she hit me up too and was like, where's the review? And I was like, "Uh, you really want me to review this? Because the album... If you're looking at production, a little bit what Tom was saying earlier. First of all, as we all know, this is Kyle, this is <laughs> Kyle and Tom have talked about in the past couple weeks. Artists kind of not staying in their lane and trying to sound younger than they actually are, so to speak. And this is Tank's um, Midlife Crisis album, if you want to put it like that. Because this is the one where even though this brother is... Shoot, I am... I guess he's probably like 40 by now. This sounds like it could have easily been a Chris Brown album. The beats are very hip-hop, very urban, which is fine because the production is pretty good. And the brother can sing because the couple times he does sing, he sounds pretty good when he's actually vocalizing and not mumbling. But the lyrics are just so, so juvenile. And it's the subject matter is just so... Lowest common denominator and crass. It's and if you're a fan of Tank and you are okay with some hip hop beats and you're okay with him singing about ridiculous stuff and making ridiculous metaphors and silly similes, then you will love this project. But me, I want more. If he had taken these same beats, done some better writing, and was actually singing on half the songs and not half sing, half rapping, I would have loved this project because the production is great and I don't mind him stepping out his lane and, and turning up a little bit. That's cool. But when you're mumbling like everybody else, when I can't even hear half the lyrics and you're a good singer, when you're, I can't even remember some of the juvenile lyrics. They were just like eye rolling. It just takes <laughs> away from the experience. I wasn't a fan of Sex, Love, and Bang 2. I wasn't a fan of Stronger. And while I thought I was going to hate this album, I didn't hate it. But it was just so boring. It was just, it was nothing. It just felt like he recorded it over a weekend. He was like, I ain't got nothing to do this weekend. I'm going to make an album. And that's what he did. I just want more from Tank because I know he can give us more. Yeah, I sort of feel the same way now. This album, because I didn't really like Sex, Love, and Pain 2. I did like a couple of records on there. But that was because I went into that project saying, okay, this is going to be the continuation of Sex, Love, and Pain, the first one. So I was heavily disappointed by that. This time around, I listened to the album for what it was. Because obviously 
being that we run an R&B website, we do an R&B podcast, it's only natural for us when we go into this project to think, okay, let's listen to this as an R&B, traditional R&B album. And when you listen to it like that, you're in for a whole lot of disappointment. Uh, there are a couple of good songs on there. There's a song with Candace Boy, Good Thing. I felt like that was a pretty solid one. Yeah, and I did I, like that one. And then the last song on the album with Jay Valentine, I thought that was all right as well. But the rest of it, like you said, the lyrics were a little crazy for a 41-year-old. But, Ed, I want to ask you this so that maybe there's a different perspective we need to take on this. As a traditional R&B album, it's, mm-hmm. not, well, it's not what we're looking for, obviously. Absolutely not. As a trap soul, and I can't believe I'm even using that term, as a trap soul album, does this feed your appetite? And I, I know you don't like Trap Soul, but as a Trap Soul album, is it a good album? If we look at this under uh, that Trap Soul genre makes my skin crawl. I and mean, we've talked about that before. If you look at it as a Trap Soul album, it's okay, again, because he's actually singing. Most of the Trap Soul artists don't sing at all. They are literally talking through their songs. And Tank actually sings... A little bit. Not as much as he could. Not as much as he should. But when he actually vote, when he actually projects, it's there and that helps. But again, for me, what drags it down is you can have the atmospheric beats. You can have the hip-hop beats. You can have all this stuff. But what I want as a listener is a it's solid writing. And good structure. And that's what these songs don't have. Like if the songs were better written with the exact same beats, I would probably raise my rating by at least a star. Because then there's something there I can hang on to. But if it's just girl this and girl, 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 and repeating the same word over and over again, and you're zoning out like some kind of hypnotizing thing, and that's what you like, cool. So if you like Trap Soul, you will probably enjoy this album. I think the Bryson Tiller crowd will like it. But for me, as for me and my house, mm -mm, it is not for me. And it's just not something that I feel like will stand the test of time. Yeah, I agree with you. I feel like, like the Trap Soul is the Trap Soul and you can't take away from that. That was his intention with the album, so... I'll give them a pass for that, but some of the songwriting, the melodies, the choruses, they were just so lazy compared to what we know Tank is capable of. I think that was my exactly. biggest beat with it. Yeah. And if you and again, if you want to, if you're like, I'm gonna make a trap soul album, okay. But make a good one. Don't make a mediocre one like everybody else. And that's my beef. Yeah. So I mean, shout out to Tank though. Whether we like it or not, he is actually, Ed, I read up on this, Tank, and actually he said this on The Breakfast Club too, he is actually the number one streaming Urban AC artist right now. So Who told least, him that? That's what he said on The Breakfast Club. Uh-huh. I'm going to go on The Breakfast Club and say I'm the number one streaming artist right now. Y'all will believe it. Just say it with some <laughs> bass in your voice and everybody will believe it. A little bit of conviction as well. Ugh, I guess. Yeah. That's all it takes, player. That's all it takes. Yeah. But, I mean, if it's true, I am I mean, shout out to him if he's the number one streaming artist with a first name T and wears wife beaters all the time. I'm good for you, player, but your album yeah. still ain't banging. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting, though, because Tank has never been... Maybe in 2009, he was considered the top R&B artist. Maybe at that time. But he's never really been on that upper echelon. But to see him still releasing albums and still in the mainstream, that's pretty cool. I mean, I wish it were better. I I wish, Ed, I wish it were better. It it was under better circumstances, but it's pretty cool. Of course. And again, like I said, I think a lot of that, just like the Cardi B, just like the Tamar, I think a lot of it goes to his fan base because they ride or die no matter what they're dropping, no matter what. I don't care if it's subpar or what. They're going to be like, this is my dude. I'm supporting it. I'm retweeting it. I'm sharing it. I'm saying it's hot. I'm writing these weird YouTube reviews where it's just me screaming all over the track saying, yes, yes, this is my review. So weird, the the times we live in. But 
that's the stuff because it generates hype and excitement and it's encouraging other people to check it out. So it's working for them. Yep. They've got to be, their fan bases have to get a lot of support for their success. Absolutely. Now, another album that came out, and this one I think we all went into with very, very high expectations. It was Lettucey's new one. Ed, I know you did a review on it. What did you think? Yep, you can go to soulandstereo.com and check that one out. And as you know, if you've been checking out the podcast, a little bit like Tank, we knew going into this album that Lettucey was going to go for another direction, kind of a more mainstream sound, thanks to a couple of her singles. But you'd be surprised, like, unlike Tank, who, like, went all in on the Trap Soul, this is pretty much an Lettucey album. A couple of songs do sound a little bit more current, which is cool, because as Lettucey stated herself, r and is getting a little stale, and she doesn't want to be an artist that's putting out the same album every year. But unfortunately, to that effect, other than those couple of sprinkles of new content, it's pretty much the same old Lettucey album. And although it's very well sung, vocally it's probably one of the best sounding albums of the year. There's not a lot to hang your hat on as far as memorable songs. So it's a good project, but it's not the great project that you were expecting. But if you're a Lettucey fan and you were worried that this album was going to be some out of left field thing, don't worry about it. This is the Lettucey you love and it's worth checking out. You know what, Ed? I kind of wish there were a little more, and that's maybe because I really love the record, but hi, I wish there were a little more of those on the album. Um, but that's just me speaking. Do you feel like it was enough of the balance there? Like, Do you think she could have added a couple of more of those? She definitely could have. And honestly, I mean, I know Tom isn't here to defend it, and I know Tom wasn't a fan of some of those songs, but I didn't mind them at all. And I think that a little bit more of that could have helped diversify the album and make it stand out and be like... Like, I remember in 2000 when Keith Sweat dropped his album, I think it was called Didn't See Me Coming. And that was his hip-hop album because a lot of the songs on it were very urban and very hip-hop, the um, the beats and a lot of rapper features on it. It was a very out-of-the-lane album for him. And it's not definitely not his best album. But it's not terrible, and it's an album that you remember because it's so different from anything else that he's done. And I thought this was going to be Lettucey's album like that. And it's like she started to, but she didn't want to commit all the way. So she just dropped off these couple nuggets and dipped. So if she could have given us two or three more songs like that, it would have really been the one that could have changed the sound and perception of it. Mm. And it could have been her... Her album that may have kind of broken her out in the mainstream. Who knows? But I think she played a little too safe. But again, the only good thing about that is even a Lettucey that's playing it safe is still pretty good. Yeah. And plus, not everyone is made to break out and become a star. Look at Robin Thicke. He turned into a star and his life just came crashing down. (sighs) Poor Robin Thicke. And he still hasn't recovered. I keep. I, I mean, remember when he dropped "Morning Sun" and I was like, "Oh, this is a hot song. He's about to come back." But it's, yep. then he just disappeared again. It's yeah. like every time he gets a little bit of momentum, I don't know if he just crawls back and looks at a picture of Paula or what. But he just goes into depression. Although to be fair, he did lose his dad earlier this year, and that was tough. Yep. So yep. that might have taken a little bit of wind out of his sails. Well, Robin Thicke, we're waiting on you, but. We got another album to talk about, Ed. We we talked about Let Us See song High earlier, and speaking mm-hmm. of high, we got to talk about Janae Eichel's new album, Trip, because you have to be <laughs> high to listen to this album. Oh my goodness. This album, this album, first of all, was one of those surprise albums that like no one knew was coming. It just kind of dropped out of nowhere. And it's frustrating because I swear I listened to that album for like 36 hours. It was so long and I had to keep breaking it up. But the thing that's frustrating about it is that, man, there are some really, really, really like some of the best songs I've ever heard from her are on this album. But they're buried because this thing has like 25 tracks. It's literally 90 minutes long. And it's just so much to wade through to get to the good stuff. 
I swear that if you took out the best track, yep. I am never as an album reviewer and purist. Like I always consider an album to be that complete body of work. But if I was like a lot of my friends and just cherry picked the best songs and made my wow. own album from the album, you could probably make a four and a half star album out of this, the best songs here. But you have to wade through so many songs that just, like Kyle said, like some of it is just like so druggy and so spaced out and so weird. And I know that atmospheric, we love that. That's the that's the sound of the moment. Yay. But, man, she has some heat here, but you just had to wait so long to get to the heat. It's like the giant, the world's biggest box of Fruit Loops, and you got to dig through it to get the prize. It's just like... You know, put a couple prizes in there or something. Yeah, it was um, it was a very interesting listen. I don't think it's better than her debut, but I did like a handful of songs on here. Some of them were a little too psychedelic for my liking, but no, oh, yeah. You know, the the one thing I will say about Janae, she's in her own lane, which is kind of cool, especially for an artist in this generation. She's just doing her own thing. Some of it is a little trendy, but for the most part, just it's just classic good old Janae. And it was also cool that she brought Brandy back from the dead and got her on a song. So <laughs> shout out to Janae. I really like that song, too. And man, there were a few songs that I liked. That, oh, it's, it's just a very frustrating listen because as an overall package, it's just like it's an overall package. I would say that it's not as good as her debut. But if you cherry picked and restructured and like did a little bit with the sequencing, she really had something special here. It's almost like, and I know this album is kind of like the Drake album that came out earlier this year where it was, he was like, this isn't an album, this is a playlist. And it seems like some artists, and y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but in this age of streaming and Spotify, Back in the album days of CDs, you're kind of limited unless you're doing a double disc project. Like your album has to be like 80 minutes because like the CD just can't hold more than that. But right. now it's like what we can do now is just drag everything out and make this gigantic 150 minute playlist. And this is too much to hold on to. Yeah. But we'll see. It's interesting, Ed. I have a younger sister, and so I can sort of understand, or at least I'm in tune with the younger generation. They look at Janae like how you look at Sade. It's crazy. Oh, my gosh. I almost had a heart attack. Hold on. You said they think that... Oh my. No, I Just said they because... look... Ed, they look at Janae like you look at Sade. I didn't, think... I didn't say they think. They just look at her like it. Oh, well, they need their prescription checked if they looking at her like that. Look, I like Janae, but oh, oh my gosh. Pray for the children. <laughs> now, a couple of other albums came out the, um, the last couple of weeks, but we haven't really had a, time, had a chance to listen to it because there's just so much music to listen to. But Shantae Moore, we'll talk about Shantae Moore next week. Kevin Ross dropped an EP and Calvin Richardson, I believe, dropped an album as well. So we'll yeah, get into play. those. Just so much music, so much. But we can talk about some singles because those songs are only like four minutes long, as opposed to <laughs> thousand twenty-five like Janae's. But Ed, can we give a moment and give a shout out to Canada because one of the queens of Canada ha- has returned to the music industry? Listen, I am all for shouting out Canada because can the for some reason if you're a Canadian R and B singer, you fine. So yes, shout them out. And when we talk about fine, we talk about Melanie Fiona. She is finally back. She was gone for a minute, had a baby, didn't know whether she was coming back. And look, she is back with Remember You. Ed, Melanie Fiona, what did you think? I like the song a lot. It's it's a very a retro vibe and it kind of fits her tone. And, you know, certainly not something that's going to be found on Urban Turn Up Radio, but... It's a very good song that I think is a great reintroduction for her. And it's certainly something that's gotten me looking forward to her next project. So Melody is just, we've talked about her before, how she's a great artist. It just seemed to, it's like she landed at the wrong time. Because in a different yeah. era, she would have been huge. 
And there's still so much potential there. So much unfinished business, so to speak. And I want her to come back and I want her to hit strong because there is pretty much a gap and there is a role for her right now in R&B. So if she hits strong, she could really get the ground shaking and get some momentum going and really have the career that I know she can have. So this is a good solid song that I think can get her on the right path if it picks up momentum. It's interesting with somebody like Melanie Fiona, like you said, she came at the wrong time. And I think because of that and because she came in during a time when R&B was sort of making its transition, does she have any songs that people would, if you ask, name a Melanie Fiona song, does she have any songs where people would be like, oh, she has this song and that song? Because I can't think of that. Maybe it kills me. But... Maybe 4 a.m., but I don't. I don't know. Does she have any memorable songs that a general R&B fan would know? Definitely not. I think that the only song that probably would ring a bell would be "It Kills Me," and maybe yeah. slightly 4 a.m. a little bit. I mean, I love both of those songs, and I mean, I love even a few more. But I think that again, she's an artist that just hit at the wrong time and even if she came out five years earlier she would have had songs that would have done well both her albums were good i remember her debut was one of those albums that i kind of dismissed at the time but my wife got it and one day i was in the car listening to it and she, i think my wife was driving and i was like this is pretty good and that kind of made me a fan and since then i have been following up and checking up on our projects and I'm always down with a new Melanie project. So, so like I said before, with so much potential that just hasn't been capitalized on. Well, hopefully this project, it's going to be tough because she is independent now. But hey, Canadian artists, they're winning. We have Drake. We have The uh, Weeknd. We have Bieber. Uh, We're uh, winning. So hopefully we can add Melanie to the mix. Another new song that came out, Ed, Maya. She just put out Smooth Jones, the Grammy-nominated album Smooth Jones last year, <laughs> which is I still, still like, don't understand that Grammy nomination. But yeah, I mean, that, go that ahead, was, girl. That was the biggest shock in all of shocks. But she just dropped a new teaser, "Ready for Whatever." Is she really ready for whatever, Ed? You know, and I know a lot of people will run up in my mentions because they always do and talk about how I don't like current sounds. And how we talked a little bit more about the atmospheric sound. And her new song definitely builds upon that atmospheric build. Just like, I mean, it's the trend right now. But I didn't realize until I was listening to this song that her tone is perfect for that type of song. So yep. her low register is absolutely perfect. I really like the song. Because unlike what we were talking about earlier about the tanks and folks like that who feel like they're shoehorning their sound into like, the current sound and just doesn't work, but they're doing it just for trends. Maya sound easily fits that mold and it sounds pretty good. So I was shocked at how much I liked the song. It's not the greatest song of all time, but if you're going to do something that's trendy, you got to make it work for you. And in this case, her style perfectly transitions into that. So this song is a lot better than I expected. So maybe I was wrong about that Grammy and all. It's still the most random nomination of all time. Let's let's keep it real. Of all time. Yep. Now, we talked about Janae bringing Brandy back from the dead and putting her on the album, and that was a great song. <laughs> Ed, someone else was brought back from the dead. Michael Jackson released a new album this this week. Oh, my gosh. I hope your house is just, like, overrun <laughs> with thriller zombies. What What's your problem with this release? It's Michael Jackson, Ed. Michael Jackson sold 9,000 <laughs> copies last week. People care about uh, Michael Jackson still. People, Yes, people care, and that's why they keep dropping these albums. It's just, I don't know. I feel like, not to be morbid, but I feel like that there are vultures circling his corpse, and they just keep picking at those bones. Like, let them rest. Oh, my goodness. I heard this new album, so I was like, okay, are we going to get new material? Oh, no, this is just all of his spooky songs from other albums. So, like, <laughs> Thriller and Ghosts and Somebody's Watching Me, ooh, for Halloween. Like, this is stuff that we've all heard a thousand times. So, And then a bunch of weird remixes of stuff. I don't 
don't know, man. Like, let it go. Let it. And I, I know it, if the proceeds are going to help his family and his kids or whatever, that's great. That's wonderful. Keep Michael's legacy alive. Still, in my opinion, the greatest artist to ever walk this earth. But, my gosh, I just feel like that it's yet another cash in that's unnecessary. And a lot of, I know a lot of fans over the years have been like, why haven't we gotten another Aaliyah album? I know there are songs in the vault and this and that. Well, player, I'm sure those songs were in a vault for a reason. Probably because they were unfinished or the artists didn't like them. So mm. what we got was what we thought was the artist's best work. So there are times, unless an artist dies and leaves like a will of an album that's like, if I die, break this in case of emergency, break this glass. This is the album you can put out of songs I approve that are unfinished. But y'all can hear. I just don't like that we got to re- keep repurposing stuff and taking bits and pieces of old recordings and old sessions and making new music. And it just doesn't feel true to the artist's vision. But that's just me being grouchy old Ed. Do you think Tank has one of those albums where it's just in the vaults, but it's like actually the continuation of Sex, Love, and Pain 1? And it's just like... I'm going to go do this turn up. If I die, then you put out the actual real music that I planned on putting out. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'm sure that's what the, the Tank fans think. But I think that I think all the juice has been pulled out of that orange. Uh, I'm looking at this album cover right now for this Michael Jackson product, uh, project. It's kind of spooky, actually. Please. It looks like an old <laughs> Castlevania um, video game cover. You could do uh, Michael better than that. Please. Man, shout outs to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say, Ed. Oh, man. Um, let me just check on the time really quickly. We're at 41 minutes. Is there anything else that you need to be talking about before we move on to the Hall of Fame, Ed? Uh, I think with so much new music going on, there was plenty for us to keep going today. Because when we came up into this podcast today, we were just like, we're going to talk about all this new stuff that we missed. So I think we've covered everything. If Tom was here, you know, we talk about blah, blah, uncooked chicken, blah, blah, music soul child, blah, blah, something else weird, blah, blah, my Jordan collection. So I just took care of Tom's part. So we're good. We're covered. Wait, we forgot to talk about Music Soul Child. The numbers are in for his uh, album, Feel the Real. Drum roll, please, Ed. All right, brrr, what we got? <laughs> We're at 4,000 copies first week for Music Soul Child. Yeah. That's pretty It's 2017. Sad. It's pretty it bad, is. but it's 2017. It is, and I think Tank and Tamar are set to sell less than Michael Jackson as well, who I mentioned is selling 9000 first week. So Michael Jackson, well, he should be selling more than Tank and Tamar, but, but not in 2017. It's weird. It feels like that in these days, that absolutely no one, unless your name is Beyonce or maybe Kendrick Lamar, you can't get off the ground. I remember what happened to the days when dudes would go gold on their first week. Like it's insane how. Mm-hmm. And I know streaming has a lot to do with it. I know piracy is big, but it's just amazing to me that it doesn't seem that long ago when people were dropping and going platinum their first week, and now it's like if you get two thousand, you're doing something. Do you feel like? And I'm. This is my argument, right? I think for some artists. Streaming definitely is indicative of the state of their career as opposed to just pure album sales. Like, Janae sold about eight to 10,000 copies, but after the streaming numbers, she was at, like, 40,000. That seems correct because the younger generation, all they do is stream. They don't buy albums anymore. Right. However, right. And that's for something some of, to keep in mind. But, however, for some of these older artists, like a Tank... They sell 4,000, 5,000 copies their first week. I don't personally believe that the number of streams is all that much higher than the 4,000 pure album sales. Do you agree with that? Right. I agree with that. And again, it goes back to the fans and how the fans consume their music. That's yep. why a Drake is going to have a trillion streams and a Janae is going to have a trillion streams because their fans are younger and they hear they're following social media. They're going to see that this album is out. They're going to run to Spotify and run to Apple Music, start streaming, 
and listen to it. And then it's an immediate thing. They don't have to go to Target and track down the album. I was just talking to my man DJ Soul Child the other day, and he was talking about how he found the music album. And he got it from Target and was so happy to have a hard copy. Because I, like him, when I can, I try to get hard copies of albums. I have not been able to find music to hard copy album at my Target. Because I went there and I tried to get the SNES Classic, and I didn't get either, and I was pissed off. But that's another Damn. story. So... <laughs> Unfortunately, when there's younger artists know how to get this music, I mean, younger fans know how to get this music and they know how to get it immediately. So if they want to hear Janae and they're sitting at work, oh, Janae's out. I'm going to listen to it right now. And some older fans might not have the, uh, not even the ability, but the inclination. They don't even think, oh, I can stream this. They're just like, oh, I might listen to the iTunes snippets and see if I want to go buy it. It's just a different mindset. It, it, I think it goes even deeper than iTunes because I feel like streaming in general, and I'm going to split streaming uh, from you know pirating because I think it's two different things. Even just the yeah, way it it's is. being it, the way, even the way it's being consumed, because you come from the generation of CDs, and obviously there was a lot of attachment there. You buy a CD, you listen to it from top to bottom, and because you didn't have an MP3 player, you would just go back to that CD. And listen to whatever songs that you liked on that CD. Right. For me, it was a little different for me as well because my generation, we were pirating, downloading MP3s. And when I used to download an album, what I would do is, like, you know, some of your friends, you would cherry pick some of the albums that, I mean, some of the songs you liked on the album, keep Mm -hmm. those, and delete the rest. But the songs that you did like, they were in your MP3 player, on your iPod, and you grew an attachment to them. So one of those songs was, I think, like when I first l- listened to uh, Keisha Cole's second album, man, I listened to I Remember like 30 times in a row. And there's, <laughs> I'm dead serious, and there was an attachment there. But the problem with streaming today, and it goes hand in hand with how people listen to R&B, is I can at least say for myself, streaming has removed the attachment part of music. And R&B is all about attachment and, you know, relating to the emotional feelings that come with you know the records and by streaming and having playlists and putting it on shuffle you kind of don't get that anymore and i think that's the biggest problem right now and that is an excellent point because not only that look at how we look at albums i was talking on facebook a couple days ago about how mariah carey's butterfly the sequencing of the songs on that album oh my goodness you go from my all to the roof, to Fourth of July, to Breakdown, to Baby Doll. Like, that is just like boom, 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 boom. Like, five unbelievable songs stacked next to each other that flow into each other. And that shows, that makes a great album because it makes a great package. But in the era of streaming, like you said, you can just cherry pick and make your own playlist. If I was going to do that with Janae's album, I would go through all 50 tracks, pick the seven I like, make a Janae playlist, and then I would be like, oh, Janae's album is fire. Well, no, her album isn't fire. Those seven songs that you like are fire. The other songs are good, but they don't measure up to those. And again, I think it skews our perception of music because you can easily say, there's so many albums I reviewed, and I'm like, oh, it's all right. And people will be like, you're crazy. That album's insane. Whoa. But they're not listening to the whole album. They're listening to the three or four songs they like. I remember when I reviewed the DJ Khaled album, the one, not this most recent one, but the one before that, that had like three or four really good songs on it and 10 or 11 awful songs. And people were like, why don't you like this album? It has two or three good songs on it. And I said, how about you take a test and get two or three questions right out of 15 and see what your score is? That is how I score albums. And that's not how fans look at albums these days. It's not a collection of songs. We just pick what we like, create our own little album off to the side, and rock with it. And that's cool if that's what you like. But it's just, again, a different way to look at music and showing how the album process has evolved. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to give you an example, I was in the car with my friend the other day. He had his Spotify playlist on, and... I swear, he didn't know any of the songs that were playing because I think he just found a hip-hop R&B playlist. 
was listening to that. It was a lot of current stuff, and he he even told me he's like, you know, there's no attachment to this music anymore. It's just, you know, I just like the way it sounds, but I couldn't tell you who it's by or what what it is. So I think that's just how people listen to music these days. I think you're right. And again, that's cool. That's how you listen to it. But before you come running up in my mentions talking about somebody's album hot, just know I'm going to come with you with the heat. So be ready. (laughs) Yep. So that appears to be it for this podcast in terms of new music and new events. But, Ed, it's time to get into the Hall of Fame. Oh, yes. And because Tom is not here, I just want to do one. Okay. Because I didn't actually ask the fans for a nomination this time around, unfortunately. I forgot. It was my bad. But it is my turn to nominate someone. And I think this is a great pick because I know you're going to go off on this guy or just the circumstances no that more. he's on. But I want us, for this R&B Hall of Fame nomination, I want us to talk about the upcoming Super Bowl halftime performer, Justin Timberlake. Is he in the oh Hall of Fame? Oh my god! Because, hold on, Ed. Three, well, I guess four albums. His last album was like 10 hours long. But <laughs> this guy, because let's, let's put it in perspective. He came from a boy band, slowly transitioned into more R&B records. NSYNC had a couple of mm-hmm. songs on BET. Then he came out with Justified, which was Timbaland, it was the Neptunes, it was Brian McKnight. And he sort of took R&B to a new level, switched up the sound of R&B, and then came back around a couple of years later with Suit and Tie. And he's, you know, I don't know if he'll call himself fully R&B, but you can see through his music that he has full intentions of making R&B. That's what he likes. That's what he wants to do. But is that enough yep. to put him into the R&B Hall of Fame, especially knowing that he pretty much ended Janet Jackson's mainstream career? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Let me talk about my man, JT. I am a big Justin Timberlake fan. And it's funny because I was quite... The opposite. I was not an NSYNC fan. And I thought that, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, they were the best and blah, 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 whatever. I like, like maybe, I remember when Gone was getting a lot of play on BET and because it was so R&B and it was an R&B song, but I even didn't even really like that song that much. I just did not really, the whole poppy boy band thing was just not for me. But when he came out with Justified, I was like, this dude's got a hit. Then he drops Future Sex Love Sounds. This dude got a hit. I mean, you're talking two legitimate five-star albums. Well, love, the the second album, definitely five-star. Justified, I don't know if I can make it five stars, but it's in the convo. And then his later album, the 2020 Experience, the first one was pretty good. The second one was eh. But still, when you look at the content, the man has content. He has the albums and he's got the numbers to show for it. And in an era when R&B was kind of wavering, he was the one kind of propping it up. For better or worse, he was kind of keeping the flag afloat just a little bit. The reason why I hesitate, though, to put him in the R&B Hall of Fame, even though when we look at classic songs, when we look at greatness of albums, influence, all that stuff, Over the years, his perception has always been more of a pop artist. And don't get me wrong, I I will argue to the grave that Justified is an R&B album. I remember when I ranked the best R&B albums of the 2000s a few months back, and everyone was like, why is this on the list? And why is it so high? It's an R&B album. Chill out. His later albums leaned a little bit more pop, with R&B songs included. So that's the only thing that kind of makes me hesitate, because... Even though he has put out R&B songs, he is definitely R&B influenced. He doesn't quite fit the mold for me of an R&B artist full stop. So that's why I would hesitate just a bit. I want to rant on the Janet stuff, but that's a whole another 20 minutes. So I'll chill on that for another podcast. That is actually a very fair assessment there. I was surprised by that. that. I thought you were going to go in on Mr. JT. 
Like, no, absolutely not. JT's my man, but and I love him. I love him. I love him. But it just doesn't feel right to put him in there amongst those who have been pure R and B for so many decades, where some of his stuff has kind of been on the fence. Right. I feel like. No, he's not all the way R and B. I think he's made some great R and B records over the years mm-hmm. until the end of until the end of time. That's a straight R and B record. No uh, question. His first album, a lot of just straight R and B, maybe a little hip hop influence, but R and B records. And as much as we like to rag on songs like "Sexy Back," you know, for what it was, it was a good song. I'll, I'll say that. I loved Sexy Back. I it, loved it. People can hate on it all they want. I love it. Super creative record. The T.I. record, great. But to put him in the R&B Hall of Fame, that's tough. You know what? If his next album that he puts out, and I know he's been thinking about going country and all of that, but I feel like if he goes towards more of an R&B direction and it's great, maybe he has a chance to get in, but right now... I. It's hard for me to say yes. He is a great artist, and you know, if this was a music hall of fame, maybe we'd put him in. But R and B, which is such a specific genre, and we've already axed out the likes of Monica, Music Soulchild. Who else have we done? Uh, John B, even Ashanti. It's hard for me to put oh, Justin Timberlake. Even Ashanti. <laughs> we oh, have to throw please. Ashanti in there. It's a I'll tough throw one. Her somewhere, all right. Oh, calm down, Ed. It's a tough one because JT has put a lot of great music. But here's an interesting thing. And I noticed this at a couple of um, R&B clubbing events that I've gone to. I'll ask you this, Ed. Has R&B fully embraced Justin Timberlake? Or are they still 50-50 about it? And I ask this from the perspective of his music, but also from the perspective of the whole Janet fiasco, have they fully accepted him? No. I think that you have to look at different... As of 2017, absolutely not. Um, I think that there were times where he was accepted. Um, I think early, the first album, definitely. I think after the fallout of the Super Bowl, no. But I think after his comeback, they started to accept him again. But now that we're in Think Peace era and got to be pissed off about everything on Twitter era. Like, for some reason, the drama has resurfaced, so now we hate him again. I think uh, the Janet thing has really, I mean, not to be cliche about it, but has been a black mark on his career for the most part. But not only that. Let's, like, look at the sound of music. And when you are an R&B purist, in an era where we don't get the pure R&B sound that we used to have, soul sound itself is like kind of becoming passe. When you hear Justin's records, which are always great, he doesn't put out bad songs. But when it's just this fusion of R&B and pop and hip hop, you're going to look at them side eye because it's like we want R&B, pure R&B to be the forefront again. And the closest we get is a guy who can just like use bits and elements of it. So we're yep. hearing the stuff we like, but it's not the pure, uncut stuff that we like. So that's another reason why we kind of look at them. It's almost like, uh, you we see what you're doing with R&B, but you're just using bits and pieces of it to like fuel your pop stuff. And that's not going to sit well with some people. Some, like, I'm a person that's not as bothered by it as a Tom. I know Tom hates that stuff, yep. so it won't sit well with him. For me, it's not that bad as long as the music is good. But I think that's always going to be a knock against them. Yeah. I, man, I feel like he was so close to being embraced by R&B fans when he put out that record with Snoop and Charlie Wilson. Sign. <laughs> oh, that was man. my song. Oh, that I was thought, my song. I thought they were going to accept him then, and then he disappeared, and that was that. <sighs> he went around and ripped Janet's top off. And uh, again, I'm not going to get into that too much, but... I don't like how we have kind of demonized him and pretended like Janet had nothing to do with it. Player, she was in on it too. She did not surprise. It was a publicity stunt gone wrong. Yeah, Janet kind of took the brunt of it, unfortunately. But everybody's in the wrong, so chill out. Yep. And before we get out of here, Ed, did you like the NSYNC song? I know you said you didn't really care for NSYNC. Did you like the Neptune song Girlfriend, at least, with Nelly? 
Mm-mm. I was not a fan. Sorry, player. Probably, Damn. and a lot of that had to do with Nelly, because I was so anti-Nelly at the time. Oh. Damn. Anyways. Nope. Damn. Anyways, that's it for this <laughs> episode of the podcast. Ed, what's going on with SoInStereo.com? And I'm asking this because I know you didn't get your Nintendo, so you probably don't have much to do right now, but blog. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to have one thing to do, and that's to snap your ankles when I get my hands on you in Canada. I'll go say hi to Melanie Fiona, then put the hurting on you. Anyway, a <laughs> lot of stuff on soulandstereo.com if you haven't checked this out recently. We already talked about Lettucey, and we've got the review of her latest up, so go check that out. Also, for my R&B fans, well, for my hip-hop fans, and I think R&B fans will like this too, Rhapsody, to me, the mm. most underrated female artist in the game today dropped her album about a week ago and it is in the conversation for album of the year seriously and there's enough soul and R&B influence records there that I think even R&B fans would like a lot of the tracks I told Tom that the best song features music soul child I was like you better check it out your boy did some hotness so check out the review of Rhapsody's Layla's Wisdom we got Lettuce's review I had a chance to chat with um an emerging R&B singer named Tina Yao. Um, she's out of Yonkers. We had a little Q&A with her. And yes, we'll have some new love letters coming up. Man, they've been blowing up my mailbox. When are you going to do more love letters? I'm like, well, we do the music, the love letters on the side. So hopefully this coming week we'll have a new love letters edition. Nice, nice. And for you know I got so, I think Tom has a couple of things lined up right now. Um, I have to actually find out what he's doing but ed i actually have an announcement to make uh for all the mm. listeners out there are you ready for this i'm ready so remember on one of our earlier podcasts i was talking about the time that i went to watch ashanti and jaw rule with tom and how he ruined that whole experience for me i remember and there was one point in the concert they were actually there was this like huge black guy i think he was like a bodyguard and i think he was one of like Ashanti's entourage and he was selling meet and greet tickets for like a hundred bucks. And I turned to Tom, I'm like, oh, can we gosh. meet Ashanti for a hundred bucks? And Tom's like, absolutely not. And I gave him, a, <laughs> this is true, and I gave him a pass on that because um, it was like 1 a.m. and Tom is a grumpy old man and I had to let him go to sleep. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to skip on the VIP this time. But the next time that it rolls around, I'm going to get it. I'm going to spend whatever money that I need and I'm going to meet my girl. So Ed, I want to let you know that I will be meeting Ashanti when she comes to Seattle, which is about a two hour drive from me. Uh, she, Her and Ja Rule are doing a show over there and Ed, I've already gotten my, you know, I got sold money and I put it on those VIP tickets and it's about that time. Oh my goodness. I need to see photo documentation. I need to see Instagram stories. I need to see live tweeting. I have to see this monumental occasion when this dude meets Ashanti and I'm sure melts into a pile of goo in her presence. And I'll be honest with you, the reason why, this is how I justified it, right? So the a couple of hours before the tickets went on sale, I was actually at the mall because I had heard that they were releasing the Super Nintendo Classic and that they had overstocked on it. Now, little what? did I... They did they overstocked on it, but little did I know that even with the overstockage, it, did, it still sold out within five minutes. So, <sighs> I, I had a little bit of extra money and I started reassessing my life on what mattered and what didn't. And Ed, I'll be honest with you, I did not buy the Declaration album, nor did I buy the... Uh, what was the latest one that she put out? Then Braveheart? Just, Braveheart. I did not buy that album either. Because... <sighs> First... No, still buy See... It. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Play it. Like, the best album is The Declaration. That's the only album of hers that I can listen to all the way through. You're, I mean, Braveheart, hating. yes. you, you. That was a wise decision. But oh, how hating. did you turn away from the one good album? What are you talking about? It was the bootleg era, man. The first but... album was... Uh, I thought about it, so I didn't listen to those albums, and both albums I still listen to. The last Ja Rule album I bought was, I want to say, Pain is Love. So I didn't buy Blood in My Eye, which no one should buy that album. And No, don't get that. And R-U-L-E, which was a pretty good album. But I added all those numbers up. It still didn't add up to 
how much it costs for those VIP tickets, but shoot, it's time to meet Ashanti. I might propose. <laughs> I might oh not come back. I might not come back to Canada. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> we may never see this guy again. And then, oh my gosh. But that happens in I November. got to see this play out. So, the, yeah, I was going to ask him when this goes down. So, this is November? Okay. It's so, we have November. two months. We got to get ready. We got two months to make sure that this guy gets ready and totally embarrasses himself in front of a national audience. But I've been living for this moment. As have I. So, that's it for this week's podcast. Ed, we're going to get Tom back next week. We're going to talk Justin Timberlake some more. But until then... Guys, this is Kyle, that's Ed, and we are out. We out.